Welcome to Tennis Channel Inside In on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Mitch Michaels here. The shortest offseason in the uh, entire history of sports is just about over. And uh, we're joined on today's show uh, by another guest, another player, one of 12 men who representing the Stars and Stripes in the top 100, a California native son who's won the national singles title playing for UCLA. He's grinded for years to make a name for himself on the ATP. And the last couple of years, he's done just that, playing the best tennis of his career. Welcome to the show, Marcos Garon. Marcos, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me on, Mitch. I have, uh, I have one thing I wanted to start with, and uh, it is kind of a personal aside. 2019 Indian Wells, I'm at the event, able to go to it, got my parents there. We walk into the main stadium court, and uh, you know how those things go. There's tons of matches going on. We walk in, we see the Canadian fans, the nicest Canadian fans in the world, they're, they're in an uproar. They're like, our guy's losing. He's got a battle on his hands. Who is this guy he's playing? And it's Marcos Garon. Uh, you ended up unfortunately losing that match six, four, but in the third, but that was the first time I'd seen you up close and personal. A lot of people didn't really know who you were, but here you were kind of captivating the crowd on the biggest uh, stages that match in particular, it seemed like it was a uh, welcome to the tennis world, so to speak for you. What are your memories of that match and giving a top five former top 10 player all you can handle? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, it was amazing. I mean, that, that whole tournament was really what is is one of those tournaments that has been a huge, you know, it's been a big thing for me in my uh, career because um, that year, like I started out the year actually winning a lot of matches uh, on the Challenger Tour, but I had never had much experience on the ATP Tour. Um, I mean, the first time, first real experience that I had where I was like, oh, wow, I can do this is uh, I played Del Potra a couple of years before and I lost him in two sets, but I served for the first set. And it kind of gave me that realization like, oh, man, I can play with good players. And so anyway, fast forward to 2019. I started the year winning a lot of matches on the Challenger Tour, but then didn't have anything on the ATP, uh, on the ATP side. and was able to get through the qualifying, which is a battle. I had a couple of wars. I, I played Kecmanovic. In a yeah. three-hour epic match, I was down a set, a break, a break again, came back, and then uh, had a battle against Shardy and then beat Dimonor in a battle in three sets. But then playing around it, it kind of was this moment like, man, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm winning matches. I'm winning matches here at this level. And uh, Raonic is an amazing player. He's awesome. But hey, like I, I, I've beaten a mul multiple guys in the top 15 in the world, and and just you know, see if you can take advantage of it, like a. Uh, being from Southern California, I've always loved playing in California, and uh, and honestly, that that match, I, I feel like I let I, I let him off the hook. Uh, he was serving a uh, one three fifteen thirty second serve, and I missed a backhand wide by like an inch. And I at that point, I had all the momentum, and so there's you know one regret from the match, and there's kind of that backhand missing it. And if I could have gotten that, who knows what happened? What would have happened? But it's still that whole tournament was. What, what to me was huge to see, hey, like I can't just play with these guys, but I can actually beat them. Yeah, it was a, a run for you, Menson, Kekmanovic, and qualifiers, a guy who wasn't playing many qualifiers yeah, exactly. after that, uh, Demon or in there. I want to take it back to kind of the beginning. The, the reports are you started playing tennis about six years old, roughly in that range. Yeah. It seems to be a little late for a lot of players. Like a lot yeah. of players are picking up the racket a little earlier. Uh, in between that time of you being six and then the junior success, all the successes you went on to have in college. But when was the first time you remember being all in on tennis? Like I'm a committed young tennis player and this could really be something. It was probably when I was about 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like, so like uh, may, a lot of players, I think have tennis in their family and mine, mine, it was like my, my dad played like once a week and my grandpa played once a week. So it wasn't like a big, uh, you know, it was, it, it was, it, it was not really, expected of me you could say um i was a super active kid and uh and i played soccer i ran cross country and i think it, it just got to be a point where it's just too much uh for my parents kind of deal but i think i think it was when i was 12 i was playing nationals and i remember going to like little rock arkansas i actually battled like bjorn for tangela there a guy that is you know I've, I've just seen this whole whole way through also um jack sock also and I remember when I first started traveling to the Super Nationals, that's when I kind of realized I'm all in on this. That slow kind of approach of being a balanced athlete, playing other sports, it probably in some ways prevented that burnout factor from happening. Instead of just going yeah. all like six years old and yeah, exactly. you know, not wanting to play anymore. Yeah, definitely. And, I, and, I, and another part of it was that like, I, I mean, I always, 
I don't, I think I'm different in the sense that I, when I was like 10 years old, I wasn't like, I'm going to be number one in the world. Yeah. But at every level I went to, I always was super competitive and didn't want to lose to the guys that I played against. And, and I think that when I, when I, it was like in the twelves when I was playing the nationals, when I got finished top 10 in the nation, I realized like, okay, here, like, this is a, this is the full, full throttle thing. And, and yeah, and I was always lucky with the, my parents never forced it upon me. It was always something that I wanted to do. Did you even have a uh, discussion or a talk about going pro early or was college a plan or were you just going to play it by ear? Well, I had always thought college was going to be the way that I was going to go. I, I didn't think about it until I, cause for me, I played a lot of, I played a lot of SoCal designates and I played a lot of nationals and I'd play like men's opens, uh, but I didn't travel the ITF circuit like many players. I yeah. played junior orange bowl. I made the finals of 16s and, uh, and so that was kind of like a first little taste of, hey, you know, the, the international. I played Junior Davis Cup and so some taste of the international. But again, that was in Mexico. But I hadn't really at that point, I still hadn't thought like, hey, like, I'm going to go pro. I, I had I knew I wanted to go pro, but I thought college was still the route. Then my last year of juniors, I, I ended up doing this really good streak. I won three ITFs in a row in SoCal. I won uh, uh, this Claremont ITF, Carson and Easter Ball back to back to back. And all of a sudden I was like 30th in the world. And so I was like, huh. Okay, I guess I should play go play French Open, Wimbledon, the Slams, and and so I did. And I still was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go college unless unless I do really really well here. And I'm really happy I did because honestly, I wasn't prepared for it. The traveling, I traveled nationally, but I hadn't traveled internationally on weeks on end. And I I I played some futures, and the guys there I thought were were really good. And so I was like, hey, you know, it's it's a long yeah. way to go. Yeah, there, there's, you know, hindsight's 2020, obviously yeah. you're, you're well beyond that stage of your life, but there's that classic story of, and you almost practically fell into this category of maybe you're considering yourself too good to play college, but not quite sure if you can go pro. Unfortunately, a lot of those guys kind of slip through the cracks, but by taking a breath and I'm sure having your family support you, it had to help though, that you were listed as the number one recruit in the country and had your yeah. just pick of any school to go to. I'm assuming. Oh, ab yeah. oh absolutely. I mean, and also like I, I knew college was a good path. There have been so many legends that have gone through the college system. Like, I mean, Stevie was like, I was playing at college and unbelievable there. And he was still winning a lot of matches on yeah. tour. And so, it, you know, I wasn't quite there, but it's still a very viable pathway for me. Did you have any like UCLA ties before you went there? I know you're an LA kid and there's, you know, that's the rivalry. Did you offend any family members by picking the Bruins over the Trojans? Well, you know, I mean, I actually like I'm I'm first generation American, so I didn't they didn't really uh play I didn't really have too many college ties with my family, really. uh, but uh, but with fr I actually had friends on both teams to be honest. I had like this this team made around JT Sunling. He was I grew up with him playing playing in Thousand Oaks from when I was like twelve on to so he went to college and he played at USC. Daniel Wen, I grew up in in Ventura County with uh, since I was young, and so I knew him. Uh, but I just, I, I, and I, and I had a lot of friends with the UCLA team also. So I, it was actually came down between UCLA and USC. And I just, for me, I just had, when I went to, I went on both recruiting trips and both after leaving both places, I was like, wow, I can really go to go here. But, uh, I don't know. I just, I just felt a stronger connection to UCLA. Yeah. The UCLA tie, uh, especially now with the program, there's so many of you Bruins out there, you know, you Mackie, Jen Brady's making major finals. Um, getting to see that has to kind of push you forward and know, you know, you got to kind of keep up your end of the bargain as well. You know, the, the Trojans were kicking our ass for too long. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It feels great. It's, 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 it's awesome. Seeing, honestly, just seeing all the college guys on tour doing well, it's like Nori killing it, but just see Mackie and Jen Brady, Jen making the finals of Australian open last year. Incredible. Like about junior year, she was her freshman year. She's playing three on the team. Like it's crazy. Yeah. And then Matt Mackie, I mean, the guys I, ever since I, I've known him for a long time and he's always been a, an absolute stud, but you know, so I'm not surprised he had the year he had last year, but it's, it's super motivating. And I think it, I think we all build off it and like, you know, not just us, but then also all, all the other American guys, we see each other do winning and it gives you, gives, gives each other confidence. Yeah. What were those practice matches uh, like with Mackie? I mean, I, they might probably were more intense than a lot of the tennis actual matches you played in college. Well, we actually played a best of five today, so that was kind of fun at UCLA for the first time. Wow. No, but it was – these matches, these college matches were gotten intense because no one wanted to lose each other. I was a couple of years older. I didn't want to lose the freshman, but, I mean, man, he was good. 
Marco Scarone here on Tennis Channel Inside In. So you win, we'll, we'll skip forward ahead. You win the national championship singles. You added the uh, lineage of that school with the, uh, and then something that Mackie ended up doing as well. But you win the national title. Uh, you, you conquer college tennis, so to speak. And then you get that wild card to the U.S. Open. Was that even on your mind? I know how athletes kind of lock in. Was that kind of added motivation? Or did you just kind of all realize it once you claim that title? That, hey, I'm playing in the U.S. Open now. No, it was it was going into the year. I kind of, I was like, oh, this is I, like, I when I went to college, I was like, you know what? Before I go pro, I gotta win NCAA's. And so my first two years, like first year, I played three, four in the lineup. Junior sophomore year was winning a lot more matches. Finished, I think, ten in the nation. And then my last year, I was going into junior year. I was like, I want to win this, and I want to get it, win it to get to the U.S. Open. And I that that's the, that was the goal the whole year. I was like, I want to win NCAA's. And uh, like, I mean, it kind of worked out. Like it was kind of a perfect storm a little bit also. Like I, it, it honestly, that, that, it, that NCAAs is, is, is kind of bittersweet because I had not lost a single match in NCAAs for the team until my last match that we played against Oklahoma in the semis. And so that was like, that one, that one hurt because we had a really good team and Mackie was playing our, we would have played SC in the finals and we had, you know, there were battles, there were wars. Um, but then after losing the match and after losing my match in the team event, I kind of was like, you know, we're still, we're still here. Like, like don't get too far too down on yourself. And I, and I, I definitely was, you know, playing to win the tournament and uh, it, it was, it was amazing to do. Like I, I looking back on it, like, and now playing on tour with realizing how hard it is to actually win tournaments. It's, it, uh, I'm stuck that that, that, that happened. What was that? What was that first experience like in Flushing Meadows? Is it just a blur? Do you have any like I can't? Oh, no. this is surreal happening. I know you ended up playing Isner, but what was that first experience? Yeah, no, no, I played Junior at the U.S. Open the year before, yeah. and I actually got I was lucky. I got a wild card into, mm -hmm. or no, when I played juniors, I got a wild card into qualities of the U.S. Open, yeah. and then I played the junior event. So I had to, I'd spent like time. I, I'd spent time in New York. But this was it was different. I, I think I actually put a lot of expectation on it because I was like, okay, I'm going pro. Here we go. I'm going to the US Open. I want to win. And then it was amazing playing in Arthur Ashe. Like Isner's been been the top ranked American player since Roddick, really. Uh and to play on center court was amazing. It's you just can't imagine how big it is when you're actually playing on playing on it. So it was it was it was amazing. It, I would have liked to have won the match, but but hey. You had a couple tie breaks out of it. Yeah, so yeah, it wasn't, yeah, exactly. you, you, had a, you had a respectable showing. Uh, going into your pro career, were you prepared? We hear all the horror stories of, you know, what life's like in the minor leagues on the Challenger Tour. Were you prepared for that grind, ready to walk in? Was it jarring at first? What were those first, you know, couple of seasons like where you're having to try to just fight to earn a living? I, th I thought I was going to be ready, but uh, I, I it took, honestly, it just took time to get used to traveling that much. I mean, besides the fact that, like, after NCAAs, I kept, you know, like, every time I traveled, I would feel like, you know, I, I'm not the biggest guy. I'm, like, 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 I'm an all-court player, have to move well. And uh, when I was traveling, every time I kind of started picking up momentum, like, my, my, my right hip would just start bothering me. And so I just – and so it was, like – it was frustrating because it was, like, I, I felt like I wasn't really playing my best. But then on top of that, I was – going from being in SoCal, living in SoCal, playing mostly in the U S it was a huge experience. Like it was, it completely was, it, it, it took a while for me to get used to actually living life on the road. And, and not just that, I mean, you're traveling to not the, not the biggest cities and uh, it's a road, it's a road, you know, you're not, you're not playing for, for the U S open championships at that time, but it's, it, I definitely, it definitely took time to get adjusted to it. You had surgery, you know, 2016, both hips actually were acting up yeah. and that had to be hard to just step away, but also not knowing what the future was going to hold. I'm assuming that, you know, the rehabilitation progress, just having to show up each day, that's a mental challenge as much as physical, knowing that you're going to have to put all this time in and there's no guarantee that you're going to be back the same way. Yeah, there's no guarantee. But for me also is a little bit of a, you know, here we are, like my first start to my pro career had been like pretty, pretty lousy, to be honest. And uh, I thought it was like, you know what, here's a, here's kind of a means to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like, yeah, it's going to be a step away. It's going to suck. But as long as if it fixes, fixes the issues that I have, I'm okay with it. Like just, it, it's going to take time, but 
do it once, do it right, take your time doing it and uh, just come back stronger. And so, so I actually enjoyed the time back home, honestly, after, because I was on the road for the first time, like it was nice being home for a little while. And I, and I actually was a, I was the volunteer assistant at UCLA. And so I was there with Mackie watching Mackie just chop opponents, uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, it, I actually was like, you know what, this is, this is a good time to kind of reassess my game. What do I need to do better? What do I need to do when I come back on tour? And, um, I didn't, I, I actually didn't feel like it was, uh, at the time I, I, I was very optimistic about it. Yeah, you strike me as someone that's very positive. Like there's <laughs> stories of players that just, you know, yeah. not so much what was me, but knowing how big the battle is and how things might not break in their favor. Is that, is that like the your own family credo? Is that come from your parents yeah. or is that just how you are normally? <laughs> People know that I'm a, I'm a hard worker. I'm always going to just, I, I tip, I, you know, I, I keep it real, but I, you know, I, I you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to keep pushing forward. Uh, and I think, I think tennis honestly kind of teaches you that you're going to lose a lot, but you got to like, you got to pill from it. Yeah, I know. That's, that's great advice for sure. And uh, it probably actually explains why you've been doing so well in these three set matches. I don't know if you realize this, but you're like top 15 and like third set, you know, deciding set outcomes in these best of three. So. Maybe there's something to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I put myself in this situation a little too much. Yeah. Now, I, I also just kind of wanted to know, I mean, your style of play, you mentioned not the biggest guy in all court game. Do you think uh, tennis fans, you know, even players, you know, recreational college players feel like they might be able to relate to you more? I mean, everybody wants to play like Novak Djokovic or, or Roger Federer, but they see someone like you out there battling, always coming to the events in shape. I feel like that might be a little more relatable. Yeah, it's true. I get. Yeah, it's true. I haven't thought about it that way, but you know, I guess yeah, absolutely. I I just I thought of that as well because your coach, uh, Coach Evan Lee, who you've known forever and who's been working on you with a lot of different things, he mentioned how you've always been playing up and and how you know fitness is never an issue with you. And uh, I think it's just kind of a good lesson to all these athletes out there in other sports because you know we're always questioning whether an athlete is in shape or whether they're just not doing enough on their end and. It's some of the you know overlooked part of being a professional athlete is just showing up in shape and being disciplined. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think, I think, yeah, absolutely. It's a huge thing. If you don't, if you're not in shape, like a guy like myself, you got to check all the boxes. You have to do everything right, or else it's not going to work out. And I think, I think guys like Mackie, myself, we got to do everything really damn well, or else it's not going to work out. And I've kind of you know I've learned that you know we're not we're not six six going to be able to serve out of a tree, but we have to do everything well, be disciplined and do whatever we can to win, you know? And yeah. so, and they, you know, cramping out there and getting tired of being a reason to lose. Like, I think the reason why we lost is it would be yeah. pretty unacceptable. Was there a point, you know, you, you come back from your injury, you start to get success on the challenger tour, you play yourself in some qualifying draws, suddenly the ranking goes up and now you're making the ATP tour stops. You're traveling, you know, hitting the different cities across the world. Was there ever a time, Marcos, when you started to feel more accepted in the locker room or more recognized? Like, yeah, okay, well, absolutely. absolutely. It takes time. Like when I first started playing ATP events, like 20, 2019, like some of the events later in the year, uh, I kind of felt the foreign, you know, and then 2020, uh, I've, I've only played ATP events since COVID since since the tour resumed and so like i would say midway through this year is it was when i felt like i'm sorry you know that I'm, I'm here which is which is awesome like at first you're kind of like well you know <laughs> can i do it you know like you win your first couple matches here you like can i win and then you start to feel comfortable and you build you build on those wins and now i'm yeah i'd say midway through this year i feel like i'm i'm one of the guys was that Berrettini win, like the validation, I can beat a top 10 player. I'm, you know, oh, yeah. I, don't know I don't know what it is with you in Paris, by the way, a couple third round runs. You must just love I, it. I don't know there. either. I don't know either. I just, I love, I guess I love playing in France. But to beat uh, a guy like that, who's, who's young, who's younger than you, who's had a lot of success and to be able to beat him indoor on a surface he usually shines at had to be validation for, you know, all the, all the time you've put in. Oh yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, it was a, it was a huge win for me. And I think, I mean, I lost to Raonic again. <laughs> I, the guy yeah. I went, but uh, no, it was a huge one because I'd beaten, because uh, the match, because I'd beaten Goff, Goffin or Goffin, I don't, I'm not entirely sure, Goffin uh, a couple of weeks before in Antwerp. And so that was my first top 20 win. 
Um, so that was that was good because I'd, I'd won a, actually a lot of matches in qualies. I'd win a match here and there in the ATP main draw, but then beating Goffin, even though he had, was coming back from COVID, was still like, okay, you know, I can beat these top 20 guys. I, I, I had a lot of experience a lot more experience practicing with them. And, but then be, beating Berrettini actually in a master 1000, a top 10 player in the world is very validating. It's gives me a lot of confidence and it gave me a lot of confidence in this year. And, and I think for me, it's like, you kind of see you past your goals. It's like you, you build off that. And then you realize when it matters that you really believe in yourself. And that's huge. I mean, the differences are so small. They're so the, the margins are so small and that belief can make the world of the world, a difference. Certainly can, you know, and then next year you, you beat Diego Schwartzman. We were just, I mean, you guys match up against each other. Is that one where you just say, all right, I'm not, I'm going to eat a lot the night before I'm going to be on my running shoes. Cause this could take a while. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I knew this was going to be an absolute war. I, I just got so much respect for him, the way he plays and competes and he's just, he's an absolute animal. But I, but again, it's like, I, I've been winning a lot of battle, a lot of tough matches, a lot of matches like in the last six months I'd won. And so I was like, you know what? I got to, you know, I'm going to have to be a dog out there. I'm going to have to be, I'm going to have to be physical, but I'm going to have to be aggressive. Cause if I let him take it to me, he's going to, he's going to, you know, he's going to, he's going to win. And so I, I, it was, I knew it was going to be a battle, but I knew how to take my chances when I, when I had them. Or with Marco Scarone here on tennis channel inside in uh, opportunity again, obviously with COVID and with different players not playing, but what was that Olympic experience like this past summer getting to represent, you know, your country going and playing and even, you know, winning a match over there before falling to the national local hero. Oh, it's incredible. It, it, it's such an honor to play for the U S to, to play at the Olympics is amazing. As I think any athlete wants to be at the competing at the Olympics. And so just to be there, even though it was definitely different circumstances during COVID and it was my first time in Japan. And so it was still pretty amazing to actually be in the city and kind of seeing what getting a taste for what Tokyo is. Um, and just being honestly, like I thrive, I love playing on a team. And so like being with all the other, other Americans, the guys and the girls was amazing. And getting us, I'm, I'm good. I was always friends with all of them, but, but then it's really a bonding experience and to play for something bigger than yourself is, is incredible. So I, I, you know, I wish it would have been, it was a great experience, but I, it would have been insane playing with in, in, in front of a full crowd and audience, especially against K in Japan, the, one of the biggest athletes, it would have been unbelievable. Still memory but, that you'll remember for sure. Incredible. Yeah. incredible. Yeah. So, and you know, you mentioned it, like you get to play in these matches, you get to play in these big tournaments because of unfortunately the, the COVID situation and, and what's going on. It seems to me like you look at this as a huge opportunity, one that you're taking advantage of and you're, you're willing to put the time and make the sacrifices necessary for the betterment of your career. Oh, absolutely. You know, I kind of feel like the first few years of my career are a little bit slower than I've liked. So I got to maximize now. I know, I know uh, a player's careers, you know, there's a finite ending. And so I got to make the most of what I got. Well, 12 players in the top 100 from America and you're on the older side, but not, you know, not ancient as well. And, and I think part of that has to do with where tennis is going with the influx of college players that are making their mark in the pro game, Marcos, but also the fact that players are lasting a lot longer. What do you think the next step is? For your game uh in then you know in the intermediate or, or long-term future you know I, I i've been winning a lot of matches on the tour but i would love to get a title and i'd love to break in the top 50. uh i finished 66 but i think i was in the mid 50s on the race and so i think i i want to progress i i where, where my i, I want to do the best that i can i don't know what that what that number is but i think i can realistically be you know i got to the third round of my first uh french open which which is the first time in my career and so it's like, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to just win a match here or a match there. I want to, I want to go and play for titles. I want to be in the second week of slams. And that's really my goal and uh, where I'll end up, who knows, but I'm going to keep pushing for that. If you get that big result, like at a grand slam that, you know, that affects your seating so much. And, you know, later in your career might be a benefit actually, because some of the players that reach it early don't understand quite, you know, fully comprehend that they got to defend those points and, you know, they have a limited amount of opportunity to do just that. Yeah. I mean, I would have loved to do it a little earlier, but you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm going to go for it. I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. A couple more things before I let you go. This has been a pleasure. Um, I looked at, you know, who have you played? You haven't gotten any matches with the big four just yet. So I want to know who was the best player you've played against in your pro career, in your opinion. Different. Uh, each guy's different playing team on clay. was something else. He was an absolute <laughs> savage. Uh, probably Del Potro though. 
oh, playing in no. Cabo. That was that was that was special because that that was playing in front of a packed Mexican crowd. It was it was incredible. The guys four hundred absolutely thumps it. I mean, playing I played very early this year also at uh, first round of Australian Open. Tough, got to set off him and. I don't know. They're all, they're all damn good. <laughs> yeah. The younger generation, the youngest tennis fans, they don't quite, you know, understand just how good Del Potro was. Like if it wasn't for injuries, that guy would have been right there with the big four. One of my idols. I remember going to the, to the U S open and I was with my friends and when I saw him play and I was like, wow, this guy's going to win it this year. And he did. Oh yeah. Oh, no. That was the, that was the biggest heat check to use another sports reference that match against Federer. Like I, we've still never seen anything like the forehands he hit in that match. Unbelievable. Um, I want to ask you too, what was it like to uh, get the chance? You mentioned having different idols. I know Sampras was one of them. Andre Agassi, you got the chance to spend a little time with him on the court. I saw the photo with you. Corda was out there just being in the presence of greatness. What was that like? Oh, he, he's, he's awesome. Like I'd always heard that he was a, he was a fun guy. Interesting. And like he looking up to him, like he's, he's an incredible tennis player and all his interviews were always fantastic, but to actually get to meet him, he's, he's such a smart guy. <laughs> like, and he's just fun to be around, honestly. Like, it's interesting. The guy definitely, like, even though he annihilates the ball, he's he's so he's so thoughtful about the game. He he's so much experience, and any question that you have, like, he's immediately has an answer and an explanation for what what to do and why do you do this? Why would I do this? What why would I? You know, and and not and he he was he was honestly I've I've learned so much from him on like he, he's great. And then also hitting with Corda, man, that was. I hadn't hit with Corda much. I've played him in a challenger before, but I, when I hit with him there for that week, I was like, this kid is good. And he had a good year. Well, it's chill. Yeah. There, there seems to be a lot of, you know, people buying into Corda for obvious reasons, but it's great yeah. to see Andre giving back to the game and that next generation just being so down to earth uh, oh. as well. Did you have any like favorite stops on tour? I mean, obviously pre COVID it was a little different, but did you have any places that you were, you know, excited to maybe even see for the first time? Well, I mean, I, uh, first time, I mean, I would love to go to Monte Carlo. That place looks incredible. I wanted to go to Japan. So I did that, but that's not quite, it wasn't quite the same experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, I always, I like, I like France, honestly. I really love that. I would love to go to Switzerland sometime also. Yeah. I look, well, there's obviously that's the best thing about tennis. There's tournaments yeah. in all these places. <laughs> so you keep playing well, you're going to get that opportunity as things keep going. Uh, yeah. Last last topic, I, I wanted to bring this up. I wanted you to set the record straight. Your LA sports through and through, is that correct? Yes, sir. And number one on your Mount Rushmore is the Lakers. Is that your is that your top team? Lakers, come on, Lakers, come on. Okay. And where are we at right now? I, I mean, there's there's some confidence, but I don't know. I mean, you, you have the title recently, but we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> we got LeBron though. LeBron's a savage. So. Yeah. You came up at the right time as a Laker fan. I'm sure a lot of generations say that, but you being late twenties, your, your young childhood memories was Shaq and Kobe. So hard not to be a fan. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's crazy. No. So yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming, you know, you want to just add to that LA sports, you know, Renaissance, the Dodgers are winning, the Lakers are winning. You can kind of piggyback sure. on top of that too. Yes, sir. Well, Marcos, this was fun. A pleasure. Uh, thanks for joining me uh, on Tennis Channel Inside In. Best of luck with everything. And uh, yeah, I think it's good that, that people kind of hear your story, that there's not just one path to make it work. And, you know, you don't have to be the Novak Djokovic types to, uh, you know, really make a name for yourself in this game. So pleasure chatting with you and best of luck with everything going forward. Thank you. Thanks for having me on.